today more than ever, there are a lot of reasons for a woman in science to lay low, follow the rules, and do her work quietly. But not all of us can afford to do this. Let's go back to the 1930s. Kamala Shohoni is a chemistry graduate from a caste and class privileged family. Yet, here she is being denied admission at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore by the director of the institute, Nobel laureate C.V. Raman, who believes that his laboratories are no place for women. But Kamala refuses to give in, and she stages a protest outside Raman's office, eventually persuading him to let her in. Kamala's small act of resistance ultimately opens the mighty gates of this institution to women in India. Fast forward to about 10 years ago, and we have a young Grace Banu who wants to enroll for electrical engineering at a college nearby. But the application form has no provision for a transgender woman like her to seek admission. Grace, too, refuses to bow down, and she seeks legal help to challenge the university. And the university ultimately does change its rules, and Grace is allowed to study there. Grace's defiance nudged open the doors of higher education a little more to transgender people in India. Cut to 2021, and nanoscientist Deepa Mohanan finds that she is simply unable to complete her PhD because she's being targeted by her casteist boss, who's also the director of the institute. The bare essentials from getting some space in a laboratory or, or chemicals to perform her experiments or even her monthly stipend is proving ridiculously difficult for Deepa to access. And her official complaints, though proved true, also bear no fruit. Deepa has had enough. So she embarks upon an indefinite hunger strike outside the gates of this institution. It takes 11 whole days, but finally the institution budges and the professor is removed from his post. Deepa can at last continue her PhD in peace. Deepa's protests shone a light on the casteism that continues to pervade our higher education institutes even today. Then there's Sylvie, a spirited biomedical engineer and a survivor of polio, who would like nothing more than to dedicate all of her time into developing her diagnostic tool. But this is impossible because the building in which Sylvie works in has no working women's toilet. When I met her about five years ago, Sylvie was on an active protest against the apathy of the authorities. There are hundreds of such rebellions simmering in our science labs and institutions today, but we only hear about those that catch the media attention, the ones that you know, make for inspirational anecdotes of proof of how far we've come. But for every successful rebellion, there is a graveyard of anonymous struggles of those who are systematically hushed, silenced. What I'm sharing with you today is what I've seen up close. In 2016, my friend and fellow science journalist Ashima Dogra and I started traveling across laboratories in India to document the scientific contributions and the journeys of women who were working in them. We call this media project Lab Hopping. And over the years, it evolved into a collective effort. And we were able to gather hundreds of stories of women scientists and scientists from various marginalized identities working in India. And through these stories started to emerge patterns. Patterns that we thought were helping us explain why the gender gap in Indian science continues to persist today. We were so fascinated by these patterns that we were convinced the rest of the world needed to know about it. And so we wrote a book, also called Lab Hopping. Now, when you write a book based on an issue, the predominant notion is that it's going to be a bad news book that paints a story of doom and gloom. And let me not kid you, there is absolutely a whole bunch of bad news in lab hopping. But because in recording and reporting on the realities of what we saw and heard, we had to write about the sexism, the casteism, the old boys club, the inadequate infrastructure, and the regressive policies that are holding Indian science back 
from its dreams of excellence and diversity. But underlying these grim realities, these rain clouds, if you will, were silver linings. Silver linings that shimmered bright enough for Ashima and I to build a case that lab hopping is not merely a bad news book. What are these silver linings? The rebels of Indian STEM. I'm talking about the Kamalas, the Deepas, the Silvies, the Graces. The group of physicists who banded together to do what many of us thought was impossible. Appalled by the lack of women's authorship in Indian scientific journals, these women decided to take over the editorial cockpit themselves, and they managed to produce 100% women-authored issues of these journals, thereby decisively proving that equitable representation is not impossible. I'm talking about those young and brave researchers who fight against the sexism and sexual harassment and the casteism that they face from their peers and their superiors, in spite of the jeopardy that this is posing on their own careers, their own reputations, and mental health. I'm also talking about those few good leaders who do the right thing, even if it is the unpopular thing, like the head of the institute who fired the award-winning scientist come sexual predator who was working in her midst. Now, you may say that she was just doing her job, and you're not wrong. But when the job of being intolerant to sexual harassment is one that is so hard for our leaders to do, to find one who actually does it is a silver lining. The past 100 years, we've seen great boosts to girls' education in India. Think about it. At the time of independence, only about 10% of our girls were literate. And today, that number is 77% with 40% of our science PhD holders being women. Yet when it comes to the actual jobs, only 14% of our working researchers are women. Year after year, hordes of girls and young women are streaming into our science classrooms, but very few end up getting the jobs that they were trained to do. The gender issues tend to get more pathetic as the prestige of an institution increases. And years of so-called women-friendly policies have really not delivered. Naturally, the question on all our minds is, what is going wrong here? Why is it that it's still so rare to find a woman heading an institute or a woman being nominated for a top science prize? Why is it that even today our IITs find it so difficult to identify girls worthy enough of pursuing their undergraduate programs? Why, nearly 100 years after Kamala Shohani stood in those hallways of the Indian Institute of Science, do we still find such few Indian women scientists working there? These are not unsolvable mysteries or mere rhetoric. Countless reports and committees and social scientists have clearly spelt out why we are still in this situation and what steps we need to take to get ourselves out of this rut. But who is listening? Unfortunately, the ones with the most power to make change are often the ones with the least courage. You may find that they do want equity, they do want equity, but they, they seem to want to get there without inconveniencing anyone, without dismantling their own privileges. So they constantly find ways to justify inaction. And Consequently, there is a lack of trust in the strength and in the integrity of our leaders. This leaves it upon the women and the marginalized people to take it upon themselves to act by becoming the rebels of Indian STEM. And it's not easy to become a rebel, because after years of being conditioned to tolerate and to accept inequality, suddenly you have to Find it within yourselves to put, it, put your foot down. And when you do, you're made to doubt yourself. As if you're suggesting something ludicrous. Discrimination in the sciences? Unfortunately, Indian science is not a safe space for dissent or any kind of activism. For caste and gender minorities in science, rebelling is often the only way 
to survive in an ecosystem that is so dominated by oppressor castes and by guardians of cis heteronormativity. Access itself can be really hard. So equality can seem as a distant myth. That's why we need to see the victories of Grace, of Deepa, and acknowledge them and appreciate them. But we must also see them in juxtaposition with this equally heroic yet tragic stories of those we lost. Rohit Vemula, S. Anita, Payal Tadvi. Science is supposed to be about curiosity, about interrogation, and about self-correction. But seven years of lab hopping have also revealed to us a really strong culture of silence. And it is these rebels that we have to thank for recognizing the toxicity of this culture and for being audacious enough to expect better, for putting their own careers, their own personal well-beings on the line for the sake of becoming silver linings for the rest of us. Somehow, the onus of correcting these historical wrongs has fallen on the shoulders of the oppressed themselves. We are restless for change. But to get there, those at the top need to meet these rebels halfway. Because while it's great to have silver linings, at some point we need the rain clouds to part for the sun to come blazing through. Thank you.